great for refreshments at the store, but this week, one of our friends who is the dragon fruit expert up in the canyon here brought us some dragon fruit. They haven't eaten the, the really good ones. Um, except this one, you can see it's got a purple flush. They brought me stuff I'd never eaten before, but most of them are kind of sweet and mild. Uh, you know, the white flesh ones generally to us taste like an overripe watermelon. The ones with the maroon flesh taste like a very sweet, sweet, incredibly sweet watermelon. But he brought us some that had uh, high acid levels too. So they gave you kind of a, almost a loving bite to them. So he's got all kinds of these things. Uh, the neat thing about dragon fruit is that the skin acts like the holder. So when you eat these, you hold the skin, and then the skin kind of peels off like a shower cap does, and the flesh is available to eat. But there are, the colors on them are just incredible. Have them over at the desk over here. Okay, so the palm fruits um, are in the same family as peaches, nectarines, but they're built differently. Um, if you've ever taken apart a rose hip, it's very similar the way they're made. So the seeds are encased in the center. There's usually five or six seeds in each fruit and then you eat the flesh around them. Uh, by far, the apple is the most prominent of the three. And uh, all these palm fruits come from, they seem to have evolved Eastern, no, excuse me, Western Asia. So that's kind of the home of most of them. And then they moved out from there. So apples, uh, the mountains, the Caucasus Mountains of Russia, it's where they have thought to have originated, and then they uh, certainly have gone around the world since then. And up until the 1980s, we didn't think that apples would grow here, because in general they are coming from a very northern climate. They uh, apparently people thought they needed a lot of cold. Well, in the last five years, six years now. Uh, our main supplier of bare fruit trees, and the only one we're using this year, Dave Wilson Nursery, which is the largest supplier of fruit trees for orchards in the U.S., pretty much. Uh, they planted everything, all the apples in their catalog in Irvine at the South Coast Field Station just to check out what was going on because they're getting all their reports. And truthfully, every apple I've ever grown has made fruit. So they planted, uh, I think, 50 varieties there and they said there's only two that they don't recommend they said all the rest were of commercial quality fruit so they're pretty impressed that the apples just don't seem to need a winter now the two that they don't recommend and we have one because people keep asking and it is a lot of people's favorite is honey crisp it makes fruit here and it makes plenty of fruit it just doesn't have time to size up uh, two problems we have uh, it was developed from Minnesota, and the summer nights there are really long, like 18, 20 hours long, whereas our summer nights might be 14, 15 hours, excuse me, summer days. Uh, they have these really long summer days, so everything to the north uh, has more time and more sunlight to ripen properly. Um, and they wake up here too late. So when we've grown honey, Chris, we've, we've carried it for like 15 years now and they seem to want to wake up for us around July instead of May, which is what we're most apples wake up. And the fruit is ripe and off the tree by the end of August. So it's got like five or six weeks to develop. They taste fine, they taste like honey crisp. They actually look like honey crisp, but they're like this big. So they just don't have the time to, uh, to do their thing. Uh, yeah, the, now 2007, the last year of our trial, was one of the coolest springs we can remember, and they woke up a month earlier in June, and they got to about apricot size. So they're actually reasonable that year. But that's it. That's the best we've ever done with them, is 
they need, so that one seems to need a colder climate. Um, but the rest of the apples that we've grown, and I, we've grown just about every single one of them. Um, well, not every single one, maybe half puts in, in their catalog because they have so many. But uh, I've grown Red Delicious, turned out look like the ones at the store. Uh, so quite a few of the apples have done quite well here. More than you think. So what is the other one that's not recommended? The Liberty. So Honeycrisp and Liberty are the two that they're not recommending for Orange County. Because they, they were growing it in Riverside County and they said it turned out quite well. Honeycrisp. So uh, that's that's kind of unusual. Of course, Riverside's maybe five degrees cooler than here in the wintertime at night. So it could be it just needs that little more winter than the rest. Um, now, all these trees, uh, as far as care goes, they all seem to like a lot of water when they're in production. Um, you know, you. One of the reasons we don't have that many apple orchards here is because of the water problems. Up in Oregon, you know, they probably get about 40, 50 inches of rain a year, and we get what, 15, 10 to 15 if we're good, if we're lucky. So they said they like a lot of water in the ground. So the main thing with the apples, if they ever look bad in your yard, just swap the water, make the ground look muddy, Constantly, you know, always has to look good. Right. If it ever looks wrong on the surface, it's too dry for the apple tree. Not that it won't stay alive, it just doesn't look pretty. They get brown tip leaves, the leaves roll up, the apples won't get full size. But if you can keep them wet, uh, they do a quite a good job. The one thing is water. The nice thing about apples and all these trees is they don't need that much oxygen in the ground. And because of that, the clay doesn't bother them very much. Uh, compost soils don't seem to kill them. So with a lot of fruit trees, you put them in too much compost and it rots them right out. They don't like dead stuff under, in the root system. Uh, apples, pears, loquats, quinces don't seem to care about oxygen in the soil that much. So you can get away with a lot of doing a lot of things incorrectly. Now, the reasons we put compost around is not because we're supposed to, it's because we've been taught to do that. Uh, the industry made a mistake in the 1980s and told everyone, well, compost is good for plants, so use it as a soil amendment. Well, we know that compost is good for plants, but it's not supposed to be mixed with the ground in the root area, it just should be on top. So anyway, um, and if you haven't heard that one before, our soil class coming up in about three weeks, we'll talk about that. Now the other thing about all these trees is they're all subject to one really nasty disease. Fire blight. And this on this pear tree is what fire blight looks like. Now this isn't fire blight, but that's what it looks like. It just happens to be something else to cause that. But uh, it looks like one little branch has been torched. And what fire blight is, it's a bacterial disease. So most diseases are fungal, some are bacterial, and this and some are viral, but this happens to be a bacterial disease that they usually contract through bees. So fire blight uh, takes the advantage, I don't know, it's using the bees as a carrier. So when fire blight infects a branch on a tree, it cuts off the circulation, everything turns black, doesn't have a chance to even fall off. And then it affects the branch, kills it. But if you leave the branch on the tree and we get into winter and it drizzles a little bit, the fire blight emerges. Uh, it looks like honey coming out of the branch. It's this amber ooze that comes out of the branch filled with spores to propagate it. The bees look at that they think it might be something they might want to eat so they land on it and test it out it's not so they leave but they carry the fire blight spores with them to the flowers of a nearby pear apple loquat quince pyracantha those are plants that are subject to uh, fire blight and they visit the flower the flower gets
get some collected. So when they're blooming, instead of the flower petals just drying up and falling off, the flower petals turn black, and you can see it. They're turning black on the on the plant. If you just snap off that flower cluster that the, that's blooming, you've cured it. Um, then we have a big tree and all the time to look. That's when we spray it. Uh, now, commercial days, antibiotics, which makes sense. But homeowners, we cannot get antibiotics. There's just no way you can, unless you're a, a, a doctor of some sort, that you can get antibiotics for your tree. So this is the, the best thing we have. It's called garden floss. And in many states of the U.S., it's registered as a fertilizer. So instead of a fungicide, so they can sell it in big quantities, cheap, easier, and not so much paperwork to do if it's, if it's not registered as a, as a uh, fungicide, as a pesticide. So garden floss is uh, mono and dipotassium salts of phosphorus acid. It does sound like one of the ingredients in Diet Coke, which is phosphoric acid. But the phosphorus in here, uh, phosphorus is one of the main minerals that plants need to operate, and it does happen to be their energy transfer system, and it does beef it up in a plant, and the plant can fight off diseases better. So in the wintertime, you have some options. You can either, when the tree is dormant, spray the branches with it, it's one to one with water and it spritz it on the branches and that will stop the fire blight. Or when it's in bloom or in leaf, you can dilute it more and spray it on the foliage and that will help stop the fire blight. Now you may grow apples, pears, quince, loquats for 50 years never to see fire blight. It just happens to be what's in your neighborhood. Because we had never had fire blight in our nursery when we were in Lake Forest. And we were growing these things for like 30 years there, 40 years there, and never saw it. And then we moved to a um, growing ground in Irvine, and there was a beehive on the, uh, about a half mile away, or a quarter mile away, and we got nailed. Boy, did we get nailed by a fire blade. Almost every tree was getting it when they bloomed. So, uh, now the other thing, the way fire blight can spread is by pruners. So if you're to prune off a branch that's got infected, the next cut you make into the same or similar tree can infect it too. So you clean off, if you're, if you're cleaning up a fire blight tree, then every time you make a cut, wipe your blades of your pruner with 10% uh, bleach. Alcohol has been recommended, they said it's not as good. Uh, flame will sterilize your tools too. Uh, bleach might be the safest one of those three to use, but um, so we do that. So that's your, one nasty thing, uh, among these trees, the pear is most susceptible to fire, but oh, it's quince get it too. Some apples are very immune to fire blight, where you know the flowers will get hit, you'll notice the flowers get hit, but it doesn't move in the plant, it just gets the flower and that's it. Uh, some of the best, best, most famous apples, Fuji, Granny Smith, seem to be virtually immune to fire blight. They'll catch it, but it doesn't go anywhere in the plant. Whereas Gala, if you have a young tree that's about this big, you can wipe out the entire tree. So fire blight is like gangrene. It starts in one flower, moves down the stem. If the plant's real susceptible, it moves all over, the plant kills it off. Uh, what happened in my house once, this was, I had never treated for fire blight, then in 1996, the year after a real bad El Nino in 95, now El Nino's tend to promote fire blight in that there's a lot more moisture around and then the spores in the stems ooze out more easily. So year after that real bad storm now, um, 96 was a dry year, but the fire blight was all over the place from the previous year and almost every one of my apples got a hit. But my gala, we can look at the gala and we can see the top was just dying back. So uh, to stop it, we just cut it off about two feet above the ground. Just cut off the entire top of the tree to stop it from killing the whole thing. Uh, and it's, it worked. And within a year, the tree had grown back to just about the same size it was. Of course, we didn't have any crop that year. 
but that's the only way we can stop it on that plant. My other trees, the fire blight didn't seem to move much, so we didn't have to do too much trimming on them. So you may never see fire blight, but just know what it is and uh, how to stop it. Um, the other thing all these things can get are worms in the fruit. So apple worms, pear worms, they seem to be all the same worm. Quinces, I haven't seen anything in that. It might be a little too dense of flesh to get into, but the apples and pears, especially the apples and pears that are ripe in August, September, October, those are the months where the codling moth is active. Um, fortunately, on some apples, like Granny Smith that ripens November, December, no, no worms at that time. Uh, and the real early fruit, there's some apples that ripen May, June, July, no worms then either. It's too early for them. The, the worms seem to be August, September, October. Now, for most apples, um, it's a simple test to keep the worms from getting on your fruit. This thin amounts so they don't touch another apple. So it's interesting, whenever we've grown apples and pears and they do get worms, before they go in, is where two apples touch because the codling moth has to hide the eggs. They just lay an egg on the skin of the apple, another bug like ladybug or lacewing larva or something comes around and eats it. It's just out there in the open, they eat the egg before it hatches, doesn't have a chance. So the codling moths almost universally will lay their eggs between where two apples touch and you'll see holes in both fruit right where they're touching. So you make sure when the apples are forming that they're not a cluster of two, just one hanging cleanly. Because sometimes if the apple's leaning against the branch, that's for the moth to lay the egg too. There's a few apples we know of that will get the codling moth larvae no matter what. Um, one called Crispin, which is also known as Musu. Uh, and it seems John and Gold sometimes does too. You can do everything right and they still get worms. You got to spray for those. Now, we, you know, 20 years we, year ago, we didn't have a good organic spray. Now we do the Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew, which is spinosad. The ingredient is spinosad. We control worms for about two weeks at a time. Um, so you have to apply it every two weeks. Now, for some reason, on apples, and I think it's peaches, you're supposed to wait 10 days after the last spring before you eat the fruit. Whereas on tomatoes, lettuce, cabbage, basil, you can spray this and eat the next day. We're not sure why they have that. You'd think an apple is less penetrable than lettuce or cabbage, things like that, but they they want you to wait 10 days afterwards on an apple. Uh, Spinosad is used a lot in veterinary medicine. So uh, apparently it's very non-toxic to mammals anyway. My dogs, you notice my dogs flea tablets. You feed them this tablet and it kills the worms. Now let's smell on this tablet. This is Spinosad, look at the literature. Yeah, it's Spinosad, real concentrated. Your dog eats it, kills all the fleas. <laughs> cleans out the worms. So uh, heavy use in veterinary medicine because mammals tolerate it, insects and other bugs do not. Yes. Yeah, the codling moths and pears, so again it's the time they ripen. They're ripening August, September, October. The pears get worms too. And I would have to say some of the pears we had that ripen in mid to late July also got worms. So mid to late July, because some of the apples that ripen early July don't get them at all, but the pears that ripen mid to late get them. So it's, it's like, I guess, beyond early July they get worms up until um, the middle of October. White. This is, uh, they said it's almost white. It, it gets a little bit lighter, just but not that much. Okay, um, as far as training goes, 
most of the most of these fruits are done similarly. Loquats, uh, something else. But training wise, uh, in the old days, most fruit trees were trained as an open base. So they have, you know, they cut out the center and let them grow like this, and they would fruit on these side branches. Now, uh, currently, it's almost exactly opposite. Uh, pretty much a Christmas tree form. So central leader. So we used to cut out the central leaders pretty short, down to three or four feet. Uh, but now we don't try not to touch them too much anymore because that's the way everybody's training now. So why the change? Uh, well, what they found is that the most efficient shape to capture sunlight is not a base; it's a dome. It's exactly the opposite shape. So a dome has the most surface area the sun can touch. A base has the least. So they're using the least effective form before because, you know, if the sun's coming from the south this way, the branches on the north side get the whole sun, these get hit by their sides, and the south branches don't get any sunlight. They're facing right into the sun. So that's very inefficient. So the dome is more, much more efficient shape. It gets hit by sun almost all, over the entire thing. So that's become, so now uh, for apples and pears, they're calling it the spindle shape, where the outline of the tree is more like this. Kind of elongated dome. It's just easier to do than a perfectly round dome. So they're doing this with the branching inside pretty much drawing like that. So they're trying to use one vertical and everything else to be more horizontal. So you can see this particular pear tree needs to be trained because everything wants to be vertical. When they're going vertical, they can still produce fruit, but the only leaves they're getting enough sunlight to produce are the ones at the very top. So on this tree, and I say this winter, if you cut all these branches back to here, you're not going to get any fruit at all because all the, all the the energy went to the top. Now, if you cut this down to here right now, you'll get these leaves will have the most sunlight this fall, and you'll develop flower buds right at the end of these branches. But the way we want to train this is train these branches to go more this way. Because if you train them to go this way, every leaf can get enough sunlight to produce, and you'll have flower buds developing all along these stems. So that's the ideal, is to make the branches, you have to pull the branches sideways, or if they're, you know, if they're too, like this one starting right next to a horizontal branch, you just cut this one off, get rid of that one, get rid of this one, because it's coming right next to this horizontal branch. Get rid of the stuff that's too vertical. Here we've got our nice horizontal branch started, cut these off, uh, make it so that you only have one vertical. Now, there's no rule, you can work with two verticals. It's just that, again, the vertical branches make very few fruit, if anything, maybe at the very top of that. It's the side, it's the horizontal branches that do all the fruiting. And pear trees, it does take a bit of work when they're young because everything wants to go vertical. So you, you can tie the branches down, you can hang weights on them. Tying them down is safer than hanging weights, and you get a good wind blowing with the weight on the end, it can knock you out. So, uh, they often tie them to a branch below them or tie them to sticks on the ground. You get them opened up and they'll start much heavier production. Now in the old days, what they actually told people to do, the old farms, don't trim them. Let them reach for the sky and the taller they got, the heavier they got and eventually when they hit about 18 foot or so, the branches just naturally fall open. But then you've got this tree that's like 20 foot tall. <laughs> you, know, you just can't pick the fruit. And of course, when it opens up, it's about 20 foot wide. So you got this huge tree. So now they're just saying, train them out. And the supposedly the most efficient size width-wise in a fruit tree in an orchard is five feet. So train it out two and a half feet from center, clip them off, uh, do that. Now the reason to say that's the maximum width is that if you have a full tree full of foliage that's five feet wide, the, the sunlight can't get any deeper into the tree than about 30 inches through dense foliage, they said. 30 inches of, of foliage, 
that's the furthest light can penetrate. That's so that air will be productive. If you have a tree that's 10 foot wide, full of dense foliage, the inner five feet of the tree will be non-productive. No enough sunlight in there. You'll have a shell of productivity around it. So they found out in the orchards that the tree should be only about five foot, maybe six foot across, and you'll get maximum production in your orchard. You gotta plant more trees. But for a homeowner, of course, that means you can plant more trees and have more variety. You don't have to have, like in the old days, one, well, even this 20 years ago, I had an apple tree that was about eight foot tall, eight foot wide. That's about 200, 300 apples. It ripened in about one month. That's a lot of apples to eat in one month. Now, if you have a tree that's only five foot wide and this tall, that's perhaps 70, 80 apples ripen over one month. And the nice thing about apples is the earliest ones ripen in June, even late May, and the last ones will hang on a variety. There's different varieties, and a Granny Smith apple can hang on until next February. So you can have apples from the end of May to the beginning of February if you pick the right trees to put in your yard. So you have succession of ripening. You can have, you know, one or two apples that you can pick every day from June through next February. And you can fit them into your yard because they're only five wide. Dave Wilson says you can space them as close as three feet. I think three foot's too close. The other way you can do it is you can either line them up every three feet or every five feet, or you can group them. So one other way of, of doing trees in an orchard is to make them make five trees act like one tree. So instead of one tree that's, uh, say it was eight foot wide, in the space of one tree, you plant four or five other trees in that group. <coughs> and grow them as one tree that's eight foot by eight foot. Each tree is in sections so that each part of each tree ripens a different fruit. The reason we would do this is for aesthetics. So you can have either a yard, like my, when I was a uh, single bachelor, I had a your backyard and it was an orchard. Every seven foot I had a different fruit tree all lined up. When I got married, the wife says, no, it doesn't look pretty at all. We don't want an orchard. So we did this grouping. So you have a grouping of apple uh, fruit trees here and here and here, and then uh, other plants around them, walkways, Daylilies, roses, other things planted around them. So the trees, the, apple, the fruit trees weren't in rows, they were in groups. So we had peach groups, apple groups, plum groups, uh, about every 10 feet through the garden with other things planted between. So that's another way you can do it. When you plant them this way, you don't have to prune as much because each tree is competing with the other tree for room. So if you put two trees, you know, if this tree wants to grow eight foot wide, and you put two trees there, they can't suddenly grow 16 foot wide. They can still only grow eight foot wide, so these branches come out, say, four feet. Those branches go out that way, four feet. They're not going to suddenly get twice as wide as they normally do just because you put two together. So these two trees um, placed close together think they're just two branches of the same tree. Of course, even two branches of the same tree don't know that they're the same tree. They don't know that. So they're just growing away from each other to get into the sunlight, so they all head outwards. Uh, if they're on the same rootstock, generally you won't have to do much trimming. Now, one mistake I made is I had, like in my last house, I had four groups of apple trees. One group, instead of having all semi-dwarf rootstocks, we had one apple in there that was on a standard. And that one apple was a monster. It just grew over everything. I had to keep hacking that thing twice a year to keep it from taking over the other ones, but if they're on, all on the same rootstock, and generally all our apples we sell are on some major rootstock, then they'll all do the, have the same vigor and they'll all be compatible with each other. What do you mean by the same rootstock? So the, these trees are grafted onto a certain type of root, so the, it's hard to see on this one, um, on this one in front you can see that there's a crease right here, so they, So the, it's hard to grow apples from cuttings. So this variety, Granny Smith, if you wanted to make a new Granny Smith tree, 
you have to take a piece of the tree. You can't take seeds because the seeds are like your kids. They're going to be different. They'll be similar but different. So you've got to take a cutting from this tree to start a new one. Well, cuttings on apple trees and most fruit trees don't root that well. You can cut, take this cutting off and try to root it on its own. It's not as good. So they have special roots that, uh, they have a special apple tree, and in this case, it's, it's an apple tree called M111. It's actually ELMA111. They just abbreviate that uh, M111. And it's an English apple tree that makes a good dwarf root system on a dwarf tree. So they take this tree and it does happen to sucker well, make new trees from the roots. So they just take those little trees and use them as rootstock. So they take the little M111 trees, plant them in the ground first, and then cut off the tops and graft a branch of this onto that one. So they're using the M111 as the rootstock with this tree on top of it. So the M111 makes is easier to root. That makes the better fruit, and they graft them together. There's other rootstocks. There's, they do grow rootstocks from seed, and those tend to be the most seed. If you grow anything from seed, it's more vigorous. It acts like a baby, just boom. So if you graft one of these to a, a tree that was grown from seed, you get this monster plant that grows full. You know, apples actually in nature want to grow 25 feet, so you get this tree that wants to go 25. These only want to, want to grow less than 20, and we want to keep them around eight. Now there are, just you know, there are rootstocks that'll stay right around eight foot, but we don't use them. They said, no way they'll make in California. They need to be in a really wet climate. They need lots of water, plus a lot of the, quote, super dwarf rootstocks need to stake on them all their lives. They, they can't stand up on their own. So we've used the one that handles drier soil better uh, and can stand up on its own, that's M111. Uh, if you go to Oregon, most of their trees are on M9 or M6, and the trees only grow this tall, but they're on stakes and wires because they can't stand up, they're almost like vines. So. Well, you were saying um, you have a way where you can group them together. Right. So, um, and you said you wouldn't uh, yourself personally put them three feet, you'd put them farther if you did a group? No, uh, the group as close as 18 inches to each one from. Now, if you're planting them in a row, I, you know, my first house I did seven foot between trunks. Dave Wilson says you can go three feet between trunks, make a single file row, like a hedge, mm -hmm. and put them three feet apart. I've done three feet with citrus, and it's really close. That's only like 18 inches that it can grow outwards, and there's too much overlap, in my opinion. You've got to go at least four feet between trunks to be reasonable as far as not having to prune it constantly and keep them separate. Okay. So and then you can, it's different apples, or you can put apples in a different type of uh, fruit? You can do whatever you want, but it looks prettier if they're all the same type of Thank you. Okay. It's like apples. Pears aren't that dissimilar, but okay. still, Keep apples look better with apples. Okay. Yeah. Right. But it doesn't matter what kind of apple. So you can you have, have any variety. variety. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which is nice. Mm -hmm. if, if you do it in a grouping like that, then do you have like one irrigation pit True. for the whole group? Yeah, I just, my, most of my trees, I had a ripper loop that went around. So of course, uh, after a while, I just used spring, micro sprinklers to get the whole thing wet. And we had up it. I mean, it was like 90, what was it? Uh, two, around 2004, well, I can't remember what year it was. My apple trees were looking really ugly. I thought, it's been only you know, about 10 years since I planted them. What, what's wrong with my apple trees? And then we had another really wet winter and they all look fine. I said, okay, this needs a water a heck of a lot more. So uh, we know that they really like a lot of water. How much sun do they like? Well, a lot of my apple trees were stuck in half a day. 
Now, for best taste, it's better to have full day sun. And that's considered six hours? Or full day? Eight, eight hours. Eight well, hours. Full, well, you know, we had never encountered full day sun until we had a growing ground in Irvine. So I thought, you know, with my half day sunlight, everything tasted fine. And then when we had fruit ripening in Irvine, where the sun was from, sun, from sun, sunrise to sunset, we noticed that, boy, they have a lot stronger flavor. So the more sun you have, the more flavor you have. Half the day, I mean, we've grown Granny Smith in between houses, where it's like a canyon down in there, so they get sun for maybe four hours. In fact, uh, Granny Smith ripens in dead, you know, ripens almost dead winter when the days are the shortest. It's like, this thing's not getting much sun at all. It's like a couple hours a day to get sun on the tree. It's, and they still ripen, just leave them on the tree. That's the nice thing about, well, okay, the late apples, which is convenient, hang on the tree for months. So like the late apples, Granny Smith, you can pick them, you know, in Oregon they pick them in October. Well, here we pick them around November, but they'll hang on the tree till February. So between November and February, they're going to get right. You know, it may take them longer because, you know, you're only getting half day of sun or, in our instance, a couple hours a day of sun on them. But they still just hung on there until they were ripe. So, uh, so that's one good thing about the late apples is they can, and the early apples ripen when the sun's straight up. So uh, even then, if you have them on a bad location, they'll still probably get right, even north side, because you know when they're ripening in July, June, July, the sun's right up, right up there, and they're getting the sunlight on them. So it's kind of convenient that way. Whereas if you had stone fruit, apricots, plums. It's not full sun on them. They never get sweet. They don't have any hang time. They're like, you know, two days after they're supposed to be ripe, they're they fall off the tree. Um, can they do okay in being grown in very large containers or yes? Yes. Well, yeah. The main thing with apples and pears and all these fruits is the water. Water. So as long as you get water, to them, like in the nursery here, you know, we'll get. We'll get full-size apples, which means, you know, to get a full-size apple, you need to make sure that soil is always wet. Okay. So to get full-size fruit, you know, we've gotten them on our trees, and as long as we're paying attention to them, they'll get full-size. Uh, if, if, if it dries out too fast, if your pot's not big enough to contain the water for the whole day, or if you don't, you know, you can always put an automatic watering on it, too, that waters them more than once a day. Mm -hmm. But as long as you keep moist, those, the fruit will get fine. It'll be good full size and big. But if, you, if it dries out too much, then the fruit stays small and sometimes crushed. So that's the only limitation. So you don't want to, you keep your tree either small so it doesn't use so much water, or you just have a big pot, or you have an automatic watering system, or you have a big saucer or anything to hold the water right there. They don't mind wet feet. Okay. So a lot of things you can do to get them pots. Uh, the one thing, yeah, it didn't really hurt our trees that badly. <laughs> so the one thing we worry about too is soil temperature. So in a pot, the soil pot is generally hotter than the soil on the ground. The ground soil, even on, you know, when we hit 115 degrees, it's probably not above 90 degrees in the ground. In a pot, it's always air temperature or warmer. So that's one thing we have to worry about, but I would have to say our trees made it through that 115, 14 degree heat wave not too bad. I mean, we got a lot of brown tipping and burning, but it didn't seem to hurt the trees in the long run. They seem to do okay. So, uh, and the pots that don't get as hot would be wood tubs, don't seem to get as hot, or, or clay, or concrete doesn't seem to get as hot as plastic. So. And when you group them like this, you know how you talk just by its own, you want them to come down? When they're kind of close together, you, it's probably harder to make them come down, right? Or are you still trying to do well, the same yeah, thing? Well, so in that case, if you have three together, you want three verticals and everything else to be more horizontal. And generally, you want them spaced about a foot apart, so if they're too close together, space them out. Now, the nice thing about apples and pears and all these trees is that each branch can be productive for 10 years. 
like on some of the other trees, stone fruit, like peach trees, each branch is only productive for one year. Wow. So you have to keep pruning that one back and letting it regrow. So you have the same branch in the same spot, whereas an apple, mm -hmm. I forgot to mention, but you had a question first. Um, are there particular apple trees that do better in, in the box? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no, not that we've seen. Now the other thing that happens, I forgot to mention with both apples and pears, is that when, they're, when the branch is young, they only make the flower buds at the tips um, of each branch. As the tree gets older, it starts making short branches all along the long branches. So those are little grow, those are little fruiting spurs. So that's where your fruit's going to come. So like uh, on this particular branch down here, it already made this fruiting spur. So this branch will never take off and grow long. It just makes flowers and a few leaves every year. And this one fruiting spur can stay productive for like five years. And then it gets kind of long, peters out. They make new ones along the, the buds here. They open up, make short branches. And here's a short branch developing a flower but at the end of it this will have flowers for the next year. So do the pears do that also? Yeah pears, quince, apples all do the fruiting spurs. Most lots don't this one. So you don't prune it when it's the fruiting Well you leave those alone so you let your branches come out fairly horizontally. What if you get a lot of them along the quince? Um, what you just showed, it's longer, and then you get a bunch of them growing straight up. Do you have to put those down because they just right. keep going? So, out. like uh, in this winter, we'll be getting in these ballard apples for the branches that are trained horizontally. Uh -huh. And all these, you got a trunk in the middle like this, they'll start, these want to make a new trunk. So they'll start taking off like that. Uh -huh. So, what you do on those is you clip them within six inches of the of the horizontal. And again, every tip of every branch, so if you keep doing that all summer long, so they, you know, you can let them grow maybe eight inches, kind of back down to six or even three, just keep cutting them here. And then past, when fall starts, they stop growing and they make flower buds at the very tips of those branches. So they act like a spur, even though they're not, they try to be a trunk, <laughs> but they would act like a spur. And eventually they'll just settle down and stay right there and not try to become a tree again. So we get the aspired apples that are already trained. I mean, the, this we had a different company last year. They went out of business. So we have the company we have now. Um, it's interesting how they do their aspired apple trees. They take the rootstock and grow it up. And then they graft six branches right where they want it onto that rootstock. So it's grafted in six places. So in the spallard trees, spallard just means they're shaped to grow on a fence. And we're getting in Fuji and Anna and Gala. Gala. When do you get those? January. You can start in a couple of weeks. We'll have, you know, if you want, because we're getting, because we lost one of our major companies, we don't have as much stock coming this year. If you want to make sure you get something, you can start buying it in a couple of weeks. Maybe I might have it ready in a week to start purchasing these things because there's some things we sell every year that we always sell out of before they even come. <laughs> And last year, uh, the espaliers were one thing, because we, uh, espaliers are difficult. So some growers, you know, they'll tell you, well, we've got, you can, we've got you signed up for 10, and then when they deliver, you've got nothing. Because they were all messed, they couldn't, they didn't uh, develop properly. So. Could we just, before you leave, uh, I'm bothered by that broken branch. Yeah, it's broken. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, is there anything to salvage that broken? Oh, yeah, you oh, can take this branch up. Yeah, and the fruit will probably make it because it's still attached by the water. 
barely. When you say tape it, just like regular tape? Yeah, splints it so it doesn't uh, break off. Oh, that's a good idea. All, what what apple trees are self-pollinating? All of them. All of them, okay. Now, okay, that's a good point. So apples are all partially self <coughs> but all orchards will have at least two varieties. So every apple tree we know of will make apples on its own. However, they don't like their own pollen that much. So you get about 10 to 20 percent fewer apples, and they're not as big and they're not as well shaped. So we noticed that I used to have a couple apples that pollinate each other while Anna and Doris had golden. Well, when you have both of them, the apples are real nice and shaped. Uh, didn't like the doors at all. Cut it down. The ants still made apples. A little bit fewer, still plenty, but they were lopsided. And when you open them up, you find, oh, there's only one seed in this apple. Only two seeds in this apple. So uh, they don't make it as a full complement of seeds. The fruit's not as shapely as it normally is. But good enough. I didn't bother to plant the doors again because I didn't like that variety. Apple. Um, so you want to now in in up in the northern states where it's colder, the apples seem to bloom over a set period. Like they say in Oregon, most of the apples bloom for two weeks, and they're all different. So when you pollinate them, you've got to choose the two apples that bloom around the same time. Uh, in Southern California, the apples are all messed up. They, did, you know, they have no definite spring here. You know, we have spring starting in January. You know, you get, get to warm, cool, warm, cool all spring long. Winter and spring, it's the same. Warm, cool, warm, cool. And the apples tend to bloom for two or three months. So they said, yeah, in Southern California, you can almost have any apples you want. They'll pollinate each other. There is uh, one set of apples that doesn't. That's the really early apples. Like, we think Ghost is one of them that wakes up super early. Uh, so there's a couple apples that wake up really, really early. The rest wake up May, June, July. They'll bloom all the way from May, well, April through July, it seems, all the other apples. So you can get any one of those and they'll pollinate each other. So you should have one more apple tree. If you want perfect apples. <laughs> and, if, and of course, you know, you just pick some that ripen. Because like Fuji and Granny Smith are good pollinators, but Fuji ripens in September, October, Granny Smith in November, December. So uh, even though they bloom at the same time, they won't ripen at the same time. I think we got all the little points covered. Are you going to get to any of the planting rules Yeah, I have brand new uh, fruit on my two apple trees. They're very small now. I guess this could be attributed to our climate that's hot, cold, hot, cold. And, and so I just guess I give them a lot of water and hope they grow to be big fruit. Well, if they're, yeah, okay, so like you see the blooms on these apple trees here. They're, they're blooming a little bit also. So here we go. Well, this one's making flower, but it's tough right now. That's a response to drought damage. So when the apple trees get dry, the leaves fall off the branches, and if there's no leaves around the flower buds, the flower buds open up and start growing. So here we're getting an off-season bloom on this apple tree because it got too dry, the tip leaves fell off, and then the new growth, the new flower buds were free to open up again. So if you keep your trees really well watered, they only bloom once, but if we have any damage from the drought, and certainly we did this year, uh, you get a lot of off-season flower buds. Now the off-season flower buds, and this is even a result of the off-season flower bud, because these apples ripened in July this year. Uh, so these came on a little bit later, uh, and it's trying again. It's got flowers blooming here, it's got flower blooming there. Now some apples have enough time to make two crops a year. So the early bloomers like this one can. Uh, the ones like Granny Smith don't have time. I mean, Granny Smith blooms in April, May, and the fruit ripens November, December. Uh, so the, if it starts new ones now, they might get this big before it gets cold. 
interestingly, they still taste good, they just don't have any size. So, and they've wasted their flower buds to make the off-season crop. The younger the tree is, like you said, it's interesting, it still tastes good, but no size. Does it do you any better to take the apple off and wait? Might as well. Here? Yeah, you can just cut Does off the little bit off. Yeah. Well, you'll save the tree's energy for next year's crop if you take off the off-season fruit. Okay. Now, one reason we know that apples don't need to chill, don't have to have chill, is because they have been growing apples in the Philippines for a generation. And in the Philippines, there is no chill. It never gets cold. They said they grow about 7,000 foot altitude on some of the mountains there. They said the cold it ever gets is like 57, 58 degrees. So no chill known. They've been growing Rome Beauties, which are from New York. And the, and the book says Rome Beauties need 700 hours of chill. Well, the Philippines don't get any chill. So what they do is when the fruit's ripe, they pick it. They wait two weeks. They strip off all the leaves. And two weeks later, they're in full bloom. And they make another crop. So they can make them crop whenever they want to. They just have to pull off all the leaves and without any leaves on around the buds at all, the buds open up and you get another crop. So that's what's happening here is if you lose your tip leaves on your plant uh, and it's warm and the buds have developed, so without so leaves put out chemicals and inhibit bud growth. If the leaves are missing, either by cold winter will drop the leaves, and when it warms up again, without the leaves there, the buds start growing. So we think apples operate on that uh, system where if it's warm and there's no leaves inhibiting it, the buds open up and start growing. But they also seem to be, respond to cold too. So the cold winters tend to make things a little bit better on them. But they have that backup system where it's just warm, no leaves, they open up. So generally in, in our climate, the last five years, the apples haven't gone totally to sleep because the winters aren't warm enough. So we tell people if it's due to bloom in April, strip off all the leaves in March. Give them about a month of uh, rest period, and that encourages the new flower buds to open up too, the lack of foliage on there. How do you strip the, what's the proper way? Take your finger, make a circle, zip down the stem, and they just all pop off. They come off pretty easily when they're, when they're mature. These leaves are mature, they go like that, they'll just pop off. If they're new leaves, they won't come off. The older leaves just come right off. Fertilizer? Nothing special. Uh, they're real good at growing. You know, if you give them water, a little bit of fertilizer. Generally, on uh, fruit trees when they're young, you want more nitrogen as they get older. The, uh, a lot of times they just need water and, and mulch on the ground, dead leaves on the ground. And just something to ask about planting. So, when we get them bare root well, even these, they don't care about soil quality that much. So you just make a hole big enough to get the root system in the ground, drop them in the ground, make sure you got a good watering basin to get it water to the root ball, and that's it. You just keep wet. Clay, sand, no matter what your soil is, uh, they're fine as long as they're moist. So you don't put compost, you don't use compost. We don't use compost in the ground at all anymore. We haven't for we don't recommend it. We haven't recommended it for 25 years now. Just top dressing. Right, top dressing compost. So uh, all the research that's out there will tell you the more compost you put in the ground, the worse plants grow. And for some reason, uh, the industry has ignored that and told people to put compost in the ground, which is driving us nuts that the academia in this country doesn't fix that because the research is there, it shows that, uh, um, that compost is very bad for plant roots. It's great on top of the ground where it's supposed to be, because compost is where mushrooms and bacteria live. And you try to plant, you know, you try to use it as a growing medium, you get mushrooms instead of plants. Because, it, you know, the, it's just dead plants. Plants don't live in dead trees. <coughs> So we have a class coming up, I think it's 
middle of October on that subject. So, but you can look at our YouTube videos and it's there. Okay, we found out 25 years ago how bad compost is around plant roots. It's, it's like you trying to live in your house with dead relatives in your house, but it doesn't work too well. Okay, the apple varieties. So there's some apples that wake up real early in the year. Um, so it's kind of a whole different set of apples. Dorset Golden, Einschmier, Anna, and Ghost might be similar. I'll, Ghost, we haven't seen enough yet. This is the first year. So we're not sure if it's going to wake up with these guys or not. The grower says it probably will. And they don't know either because they're up in Fresno where nothing wakes up real early anyway. So Dorset Gold usually wakes up uh, at the end of January. Bluton, January, February. Einschmier is about the same. And it's more like February. Ghost, we think, will open up in February. So that's your blooming period. And then ripening um, June, June, July, July. These apples will never fail to make a huge crop in your yard. There's, uh, we like, of these four so far, we like the Anna the best. Golden Dorset and Einstein are both daughters of Golden Delicious. And because they ripen in June, and it's, and it's usually June gloom in June. They don't get under peak, so they always come out, well, around here anyway, they come out pretty tart because we don't have the heat and the sunlight. Uh, my father-in-law, when he lived in Hemet, fine. It's hot in Hemet in June. <laughs> so uh, Dorset, Einschmier came from Israel, Anna came from Israel, Dorset Golan came from Bahamas. Uh, in those countries, it's already sunny in June, so no problem, they're fine. So if you live in inland Orange County, in the canyons, these may be fine there too. And it comes out and starts ripening the last week of June into early July. It's usually if you have enough sun by then, it's quite good. They're good off the tree, but all the early apples have a very short shelf life. Like Fuji has the longest shelf life. You can take a Fuji home, leave it on your kitchen counter, two weeks later it still tastes nice and firm. Uh, Dorset Gold, Lines, Miranda, Picket, leave it on your kitchen counter for two days. It's already mushy. Mm -hmm. So they have no shelf life. They don't have good hang time. Like a Fuji, you can leave it on the tree for a month. It hasn't changed. And uh, the moment it gets three quarters red, you pick it. If you let it go totally red, it's turning to mush already but they'll all store well in the fridge in a Ziploc bag. So you put them in a Ziploc bag. Now, the thing that ripens apples is oxygen and warm temperatures. So if you exclude the oxygen, they don't ripen any further. So you take a Ziploc bag. Now, one of our home, our, um, our assistant manager, her mom would do this with any apples she bought at the store. Put it in a Ziploc bag, close it, open one corner, stick a straw in there, suck out the air, and then zip back up and and then she said, oh, the apples last half a year this way, and they do. You take out the oxygen, they won't ripen. So you can do that with these, put them in Ziploc bags. We know they store at least two months in a Ziploc bag with no air in it. And they'll be cute. Stay perfectly crunchy and crispy. The Anna, to me, is close to being as good as a honey crisp, too, to tell you the truth. That's what I was going to ask you. It's pretty good. It's got some, you know... It's sweet apple, but it's got enough bite to make it interesting. Whereas these run on the tart side, and Ghost to me is a little bit bland, like Gala. I mean, Dave Wilson said Ghost like Anna, but when we've tried the Ghost, it's a little bit flat. The Anna's got a little better acidity to it, a little better punch to it. What's your good for cooking? The late apples are better for cooking. The early apples, I don't know, they probably still work. Late apples usually have the early apples. It's interesting. You pick them, and then you pick a late apple like Granny Smith. Granny Smith weighs like twice as much. There's twice as much stuff in that apple. 
it's just a very dense fleshed apple, whereas the early apples tend to be very light, almost like they're foam instead of, of, of flesh. They're still good, though. You know, and uh, well, these early apples will outproduce all the late apples, especially when they're trees are young. It's like every bud on the branches on these things wants to make a fruit. Now, okay, I didn't mention this. So when they do bloom, they usually bloom in clusters of five to nine. So each cluster of flowers can make, you know, nine fruit. Well, that's too many. You only want one there. And you want, you want the apples on the branch to be spaced at least six inches apart. So you're, you, you're thinning out 80, 90% of your crop when you, when you thin them out. So when they get about the size of uh, your thumbnail, you know they're going to stay on the tree because they abort a lot of the little apples when they bloom. A lot of little apples, when they're about pinky nail size, they turn yellow and fall off and they're aborted. But if you see a cluster of more than one, you got to thin them out. Uh, now, one note of caution, if you pull them off, sometimes you pull the whole cluster off. So it's better to snip them off, get some scissors out so you can do that real fine work between the little buds of the developing fruit and just snip off all but the nicest one. Now on some apples, uh, like the big Johnny Golds and Mutsu, they're monster apples. We'll often pick the smallest one of the group because they're too big. Uh, oh, one, I mean, one thing I mentioned, there's one other problem with apples that's called uh, bitter pit. It's equivalent to blossom and rot tomatoes. So if the fruit's really big, it doesn't have enough, a young plant doesn't have enough calcium to finish the fruit off. So on tomatoes, it's that hard brown area at the bottom. That's equivalent to bitter pit and apples. And apples, you get this big apple at the store, you notice, and you bite into it, and there's this brown area inside. Uh, hard brown or that's bitter pit. Didn't have enough calcium to finish that part of the flesh off, so it just turned brown and got hard. And sometimes on your apples, you'll see it on the skin of the flesh, brown sunken areas too, that's bitter pit. Not enough calcium. The tree now, most apple trees within five years uh, mature enough, they get enough calcium up there, they can, it doesn't happen anymore. But some of the bigger apples, uh, like Mutsu, almost always get it because they make grapefruit sized apples and the tree just can't supply that much calcium to that bigger fruit. So what the orchards do, and, and we have on the shelf, is this calcium spray. You sp actually spray the apple as it's developing, and once a week spray it with calcium. And uh, then it stops doing that. But most apples will go through that period and be fine. Is that the same for Mutsu? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they can still get bitter too. It's like potted tomatoes get that blossom and rot too. And a lot of times it has nothing to do with how much calcium is in the ground. It's just the plant's not developed enough to pull the calcium off and put it into the food. Um, on Fuji apples, and we'll talk about Fuji in a second. On Fuji apples, the when they first came out, the growers were greedy and they're letting the trees make too much fruit because they're getting a lot of money for them back in the 80s. And they're all turning out really bland. And, you know, the first Fujis on the market in the early 80s were really good. They are big, they are incredibly good. Then later on, in the 90s, they got smaller and smaller because the growers laying too much fruit and they had no taste. So they got a backlash on that. So they actually, I guess, the University of Washington or somebody told them, you got to fix this. So they had a study and they found out that to get the correct sweetness on a Fuji apple and the correct flavor, they would have to have only one apple for every 27 leaves on the tree. So they had to figure out visually how to do that. <laughs> so that's on apples, that's what you can say. You only want one apple for every 27 leaves and you get the best apple you can get. But uh, So you'll notice at the store, you know, those bags of little apples, yeah. They just don't taste that good. They're cheap. But that's because the grower didn't thin them out. So they are little, and little apples, there's too many of them, so they don't have any flavor. So the big apples taste better than little apples do, because they were thinned out better. Okay, so the next apple is uh, Gala. Ripens August. 
blooms, uh, I would say May, June. And because they bloom late here, they tend to be a little bit small too, so it's hard to get a big gala apple. Uh, and again, gala, most susceptible apples to fire blight. So if you grow gala, I'll get some of this garden pots and spray it so you don't get fire blight on it. Uh, next apple to ripen that we carry is uh, John and Gold. Same bloom period, this one is uh, early September. Now, what we know about apples is the temperature that two or three weeks before they ripen determines the quality of the apple, and the apples don't like to be consistently hot at that time. So, now Gala can handle the heat, so we know Gala doesn't mind being ripening in August, but John and Gold near the coast turns out to be John, better than John and Gold inland because it ripens in early September. You can have a heat wave at that time, and inland you get bitter pit and other things going on from the heat. But I have a customer right on the coast of Hidden Beach. They planted, they keep on planting more John and Gold. They said, This is incredible here in Huntington Beach. It's John and Gold apple. So, uh, so the apples are ripe in the heat, better near the coast. Uh, Fuji comes in next, late September, October. Now Fujis are turning out pretty good inland, but still, I had a customer in uh, uh, Laguna Niguel, Fuji apple Laguna Niguel. They said better than the stores. He was just ecstatic about his Fuji apple there. So better and. You know, better again near the coast, but still, uh, we saw a video on apples in Riverside and the Fuji's were still turning out quite good there. Uh, Braeburn, November. And then we have the Australia. So, Rayburn, Gala are from New Zealand, and then the Australian apples come in next. So the Australian apples are Pink Lady, Granny Smith, and Sundowner. Now they changed the name on Pink Lady and Sundowner when they brought them to the U.S. Um, you buy pink lady apples at the supermarket, you'll know sometimes it says Cripps Pink. It's Mr. Cripps. Uh, Cripp created Pink Lady and Sundowner in Australia, and then Sundowner's Cripps Red. Well, Sundowner is Australia's number one dessert apple, and we've grown it. We just started growing these a few years ago. Our first crop uh, two years ago was really good. That's a good apple. Sundowner, so if you know Pink Lady, it's crisp. It's sweet and it's tart at the same time. Uh, to me, some pink lady lends a little close to Granny Smith and hardness. And sometimes when I bite into the pink lady, it gives so suddenly. You're, you're biting so hard and it gives so suddenly you bite your lip uh, or you bite your tongue because it gives so suddenly. Uh, and Granny Smith to me is the same way. It's so firm that it, it, you, you kind of bite your mouth when you're eating it. Sundowner is a little more tender than pink lady and a little bit sweeter, but very close. They're siblings, they have the same parentage. Uh, Sundowner wasn't brought to the U.S. until recently because Sundowner looks just like a red Fuji. So it's hard to distinguish them at the supermarket, so there's the potential there. Now Fuji, there is the regular original Fuji and then the red Fuji. Um, most people like red apples, so in Gala, there's the original Gala, which was half green, and the Royal Gala, which is more red. Uh, in theory, the more red food have more of the certain antioxidants, so red is more appealing to people because it's more nutritious. But the taste tests, it's funny because um, back in the 90s, um, the Washington Apple whatever the group is, organization, 
wanted to figure out a way to make the reddest and delicious apples more appealing to the customers. So they wanted to figure out which, how to tell customers which red delicious apple tasted the best. They found out it was the greenest one. So they said, oh, well, forget this campaign. We're not gonna tell them that the greenest red delicious apples taste better than the red ones. And they found the same thing. The original green food tastes better than red. The original gala tastes better than the royal gala. However, because eyesight is part of taste, the red foodies always win the taste test over the original food because of the appearance. But in connoisseurs of Thai, the green ones taste better than the red ones. So, but uh, you know, your your mind can play tricks on you. So anyway, uh, that was that. Uh, anyway, pink lady rice and sundowner all seem to ripen at the same time now. Granny Smith is the interesting one because they grow that in Oregon. And they, you know, first time we got Granny Smith, it said it needed 500 hours to chill. But we looked out where Granny Smith comes from in Australia, and it comes just outside of Sydney. We're going, well, there must be a mountain there somewhere. Because Sydney is like Mazatlan, it's dead in the tropics. Because uh, they grow pineapples and everything in Sydney. Well, they showed a picture of Granny Smith apple trees, orchards in Sydney next to pineapple plantations. <laughs> so uh, Granny Smith came from near sea level in Sydney. We saw a picture of the original tree and it's right in the tropics. Doesn't need any cold at all. Um, Pink Lady and Sundowner came from Perth, which is the same latitude as Los Angeles. So these these are highly adapted to our climate. You know, we Granny Smith, I mean, you'll get these apples bigger than ones at the store on your trees around here. It's just incredible what they can do. Now, I don't know if they do this in Australia, but in Southern California, you can leave the Granny Smith on the trees until they're fully ripe. So, you know, in October, they pick them in Washington, Oregon, so they don't freeze on the trees. But here, you can leave them on until they actually turn yellow. So around Christmas time, they turn yellow. By New Year's Day, they've got this perfume coming off them that's incredible, this fragrance coming off them. I mean, uh, my Granny Smith was located about 50 foot from the street. When I drive up in my truck, I can smell them. I can smell the apples on the tree on the side of the house from 50 foot away because of the fragrance they're giving off off the fruit. So they become highly fragrant um, when they turn yellow. So when you have your option, you can eat them as a crisp tart apple, or you can eat them as crisp yellow sweet apple. They just hang on the tree forever. So that's where, and I don't know, maybe in Sydney they pick them yellow. I don't, I don't know what they do there. But anyway, Sundowner, Pink Lady, Grand Smith seem to be really well adapted to our climate. And all laid apples. So they have, to us in November? November, December. I would say you pick most of the crop in December. I have sundown that I bought here two years ago. Mm -hmm. And when do they bud? Uh, about the same time, May, June. All these tend to bloom around the same time, and they bloom sporadically for a long period of time. And they I would say November through January, and then Frank's going to hang on until February. So usually you can eat them all, and by December they're perfectly fine, but you can leave them on the tree and they'll hold very well that way. And these, you know, I've only seen a worm, and I think one apple of these three have them. It's so late in the year, they just don't get the worm. So Gala, Jonago, Fuji, sometimes Braybird get worms. You have to make sure they're hanging clean. Now there's another apple we're getting in that I just don't know much about, Arkansas black spur. I think it falls in with Braybird. have said this is their favorite apple so they want us to carry it so we were carrying it um, but I haven't really eaten it right but we've seen them producing heavily on the trees but then they sell and there's another apple in here 
Um, it's just a novelty. I think it falls in here. Pink Pearl. Say yellow skinned apple with red flesh. Mm. So it's got the word flesh, but it's, it is on the tart side. about that apple at all, but a lot of people have asked us for it for this coming year, so we're, we got some in last year. Let me just see what it says about it. Now, just so you know, 100 years ago, no, maybe 150 years ago, apple was by far the most important fruit for anyone in the North American world, and the reason for that was is because it's, it's, it, we didn't have refrigeration in those days, because we had the winters, but apple is one of the few fruits that would that you would eat all winter long when there's nothing else fresh to eat. That kept people alive or healthy in the winter time when all they had was preserved foods and, and meat. Plus, um, before we had water, the water districts and water industry, there was no water in the U.S. that was perfectly safe to drink. So they made apple cider, and apple cider was clean. So they said the number one drink in the U.S. before refrigeration was apple cider. It was the only thing safe to drink. You couldn't drink river water. I mean, you could drink it and take your chances, but there'd be a lot of bacteria. Apple cider didn't have it, so apple cider was by far so everybody had apple trees. I mean, everybody had apple trees. You had to have an apple tree, and generally the apples we grew back in those days were the storage apples. Couldn't eat them off the tree. You had to pick them, throw them in the basement or in a barrel, wait a few months until they actually got soft, and then you can eat them. Uh, you know, Johnny Appleseed went around the country just throwing apple seeds in the ground, and most of them were, quote, storage apples, that stuff you couldn't eat right off the tree. But the wine sap, well, let me just seal that real fast here. Wine sap apple, longtime favorite late red apple. Lively flavor, use fresh or cooked. Mm. And the pink pearl. Pink flesh, highly aromatic, medium size, cream and pale green skin, tart to sweet tart. It's pretty tart, truthfully. Uh, good keeper, tasty, colorful applesauce. Uh, Early ripener, early fall harvest, so that would be right where I put it. Well, maybe a little bit further down. So those are the apples. Um, and we have about half of these still in stock. Well, two thirds of them are still here. And if you plant them now, most of these trees will fruit. You know, 20 fruit on each tree this next year. If you get a new one with bare root, you might get a few, one or two apples. So that's the advantage of getting a little older. Any questions before we switch? Curious. Um, I found that I like when I do the mobile before with the kind of first thing I the envy apple. Have you heard of that one? Heard of it, haven't heard of it. I mean, there's a lot of apples that do well here. Well, I, I don't know how it would do here. I, I just thought maybe. There's another apple waiting for. Now, unfortunately, with all fruits, it 
you know, that are commercial like this. A lot of the stuff that you can find at the supermarkets, like, uh, what's that, uh, M, M. Rocha, and there's Opal. We can't get those out, even though they're really good, because the farmers, commercial farmers have uh, exclusive rights to those for like 10 years. And we don't know the reason for this. Like, if the homeowner got to grow the apple needed, wouldn't they buy it at the store too? They like the flavor, but they figure if a homeowner grows it, then they're not gonna buy it from the farmer, but it doesn't make any sense. It's like, uh, anyway, that's their feeling though, is that this, the commercial orchards get exclusivity for it for like seven to 10 years. Uh, there's supposed to be a new one coming down from New York called uh, Sweethearts or something like that. That's supposed to be a daughter of Honeycrisp because even in New York, the Honeycrisp hasn't done that well. So they made one that did need the Minnesota winter. And uh, so we're waiting for that one. And there's another one that was made by the same people who made Honeycrisp called uh, and we grew that. We got a hold of some quote, commercial trees and zest our apple, and that was wonderful. They, they said it tastes like brown sugar, and it does. Uh, and it, did, it does well here. We had one of our employees take one home and grow it the next year and made good apples that time, too. But it's not on their list, so it must be one of the commercial apples that we're not supposed to have. So we'll see if any more of those appear. So they they make these lists of trees that are available after the season gets underway, and we think some of the quote, um, exclusive commercial apples get stuck on there by mistake, and sometimes we'll order real fast and buy those. Some of the literature, they incorrectly tell you that commas, commies, commas, pear does fine here. I've grown commas pear for at least 30 years. I've got maybe two pears off the tree in 30 years. It doesn't grow here. Yeah. So the books are wrong on that one. Um, so the straight, now pears come from Asia. Either, you know, the, the European pears came from Western Asia, Eastern Europe, and then the Asian pears, like the Japanese pears, came from West, Eastern Asia, and then there's other pears that come in between. So the pears come from quite a few places. Uh, but the rare Eastern pear hasn't done that well here. That said, we've got a new one that this year made pears. It may not be a straight European pear, but it's called Southern King. That is the European type pear that made fruit for us. So it may not again it may not be 100 percent European, but it's and they're selling as a European pear. And it actually fruited quite flowered and fruited quite well for us this year. Now we didn't get to test the fruit on it. But uh, here. Southern King, high quality traditional pair, unknown parentage, popular in Houston and low chill areas. Good for fresh eating and canning, less than 400, 400 hours of chill needed. So it, it's all fruitful. So this year our tree uh, bloomed quite well with only about 280 hours of chill. So it's a very low chill pair. So we think this one, if you like Bartlett pears or the European type pears, this may be the best one. Now the one we've been carrying over a long period is Hood. That's this tree here. So Hood is a what is called a Southern Cross. So what they did uh, 30, 40 years ago is they took European pears and crossed them with the Japanese pears, the Asian pears, you know, the hard, the firm pears in the store. And they made a cross and they called it the, they call it, um, I forgot the name, the first one they made, um, I don't remember now. It had a 
had very low chill, but it was a lousy fruit. And they made several of those. They crossed Asian and European and got some that didn't need much chill, but the fruit quality wasn't very good. So they took those and recrossed them with European pears and got hood. So hood is, um, was developed for Florida. Uh, there's a couple coming out of Florida, Florida Home, the hood, or the pear. And uh, between those two, Florida Home hasn't done well here at all. It needs more chiller again, maybe 300 hours, but the hood has never failed. And it seems like the warmer the winter we had, the better it's done. So this thing probably needs only about 100 hours or less of cold winter, if that. And it makes uh, big pears uh, shaped about like this. And you treat it like the European pears. So European pears, uh, generally you pick them firm. So they're green, 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 and then a few weeks before they're ripe, they kind of turn lighter green. And that's when you pick them. The other way you tell when the fruit is ripe. Right. Yeah, it's hanging, you turn it sideways 90 degrees, if it pops off the stem, it's ready. And then you just pick them and let them ripen in your house, and they'll ripen properly. If you let one of the European pear types ripen on the tree, they have what is called the uh, brown core. So the outside of the pear is perfectly ripe, the inside is already brown mush. And you'll get that at the supermarket occasion too. Uh, they pick them too late. The inside has ripened before the outside. So you have to pick them earlier before the inside starts to ripen and store them in your house till they're ripe and then they're fine. So that's one problem with quote European type pears, you have to pick them early. The Asian type pears, you leave them until they're ripe, but Asian type pear trees uh, generally need more cold, 300 hours plus. And for most of our customers, they haven't had a good crop now. We have a few customers in certain areas that are growing here for the Asian pears line. So some areas around here have more chill than others, but most people don't get enough chill. The hood, and then the Southern King may do well for you. Now, hood seems to operate better with a pollinator. Um, when I had, when I first planted hood in Florida Home, they would bloom together and make fruit, and then the Florida Home because of the lack of water chill died on me. And the hood wouldn't produce for a few years. And I was getting ready to throw it out, and then we had these real hot winters like in 2013, 2014, and some of this thing went to town. It was making 400, 500 fruit on the tree every year. I went, okay, I can't throw this away there. But for years, it salted without the pollination part, but apparently uh, when it gets mature, it produces no matter what. Now pears, uh, more subject to fire blight than apples. That's one problem with pears. You have to watch for fire blight constantly. So be aware of that. So the Southern King and Hood will have, you like know, Hood, okay. Because we lost one of our suppliers, our other supplier sold out of Hood too quickly. They don't have enough, so we're not getting Hood. We're getting in Keeper. Now, We've grown keeper in the past. Love the production in the in the form of the fruit. Beautiful fruit. Our first thought on keeper was it was a little bland. Dave Wilson's telling me that their taste test keeper is better than hook. We're going to try it one more time to see again if it's if keeper is better hood or worse than hood. The keeper pear is a beautiful pear shaped pear. When we grew them, they were shaped like that. This beautiful, kind of rustic, or russet brown flush uh, pears. Absolutely gorgeous fruit. And they did quite well for us. So we'll try to keep the pear one more time. And we are going to carry for people who want them or are in the right spots. The 20th century. And the Hosui. Hosui is the Japanese pear with the lowest chill on it, and Hosui is the top rated uh, Asian pear. Um, back in the 80s, late 80s, I grew 20th century. Hosui wasn't around then. We grew uh, 12 varieties of Asian pears, the all fruit. But the late 80s, we had winters that were 35 degrees every single night. 
every single night in December, January was in the 30s. Haven't seen that since the late 80s, but 20th Century did wonderful. Kikusui, Shinseki, Shinko. We had a whole slew of Japanese pears in my backyard that grew quite well. Shinseki was my favorite and had the highest chill, though, of that group. Kosui is now considered really uh, the, the top of the line, and I've eaten one, and it is quite good. Um, the reason why I like Shinseki and Kosui is because they have a, their combination of sweet and tart. It's like 20th century, this sweet. And it's got a, it's crispy like an apple, but it's much more tender than most apples, so it's, and it's juicier. It's like eating crushed ice. So it's, it's a different flavor sensation, but Kosui and Shinseki, they're sweet. But they're tart near the skin, and near the pit, near the core. So you get this variation of flavors in there. It's a real refreshing taste. So these two will carry two. If you live anywhere near a riverbed, you can probably grow these and get fruit. The riverbeds are the coldest air locations in the winter. Santa Ana River, if you live, live within a quarter mile of Santa Ana River, these have done well there. Because that's a big, a big river, it rains a lot of cold air from all the mountains in the area. Uh, San Juan Creek, but any major river in this area, you'll do well with the Asian carers. If you're in the canyon up here, you'll do well with the Asian carers. There used to be a Asian pear orchard along the Sun Hill Canyon Road, I believe. I don't see it anymore. And you got too warm in the 90s. That's your Asian pears. Question on the pears. The Asian pears don't seem to get fire blight as bad as the European types. The keeper, when we grew it, didn't seem to get fire blight that bad either. But keep an eye out for fire blight. Quince. Uh, quince is unusual, it doesn't seem to make me chill. Now, quince is one of these fruits you don't eat off the tree. Um, the flavor, it looks like a fuzzy pear. It's got this nice thick fuzz. Now, there are some quinces without fuzz, and most of them have fuzz on the skin. They're shaped like pears, but they're much denser. It's like eating a piece of rubber. If you try to eat them fresh, it's like rubber. So they're usually baked, they're steamed, they're boiled, and cooked. The reason why people love them is they're incredibly perfumey. So they've got a lot of flavor in them. So you get you know, our customers who buy them, remember quince pie and quince preserves. It's highly, highly, you know, it's like pear times 10. You know? It's just much more flavorful. Uh, my daughters make baked uh, quinces. Those are good, just bake them. They're incredibly good when they're baked. So uh, wonderful taste treat, but you can't, generally you don't eat them raw. Uh, they don't seem to need any chill. They don't even seem to need any budwood. They bear on new growth. But they are highly subject to fire blight. So you can trim these like crazy. They don't get too big. Uh, generally the full size on quince is 10 to 12 foot tall and wide. They're beautiful landscape plants. They have all these twisty branches. Big flowers, bigger than pear and apple flowers. Nice ornamental tree. They are subject to fire blight too, so watch them on that. But uh, and this is pineapple quince, which is the most popular quince because it's got that nice sweet tart flavor to it. You normally pop that a lot. Yeah, to make it look pretty, I probably cut it around here. But you don't have to. Don't know what happens is this the fruit as they form fruit, the fruit just weighs the branches down like that. They're, they're usually pretty fountainy looking because of the fruit. Then we also have loquats, which is native to China. And loquats are evergreen. And the one distinct distinction was loquat, according to the literature, this is one crop even in California. If we have normal rainfall, and we haven't had it for, well, we had it two years ago, but we 
have that much of it. But if you get normal rainfall, this tree can produce a crop with no irrigation. So you'll see low plots and empty lots still doing okay because their fruiting season is, you know, the fruit develops over winter. So it has the water at that time, and they ripen right at toward the end of spring. Now, it, every year is different. So normally they bloom between October and January. And normally the fruit ripens between January and July. But every year it's a little different. Um, most loquats, loquats are partially self-fertile. It is safer to have two trees though just in case they're not fully self-fertile. Um, they look like little pairs up in clusters of about 10 or 12, even 15 sometimes. They're usually orange in color. Uh, they're, so they look like pears, even like a pear, but they taste like a peach, a sweet tart peach. And all the ones we grow are seed grown, so everyone can be a little different. Um, we grew a lot from seed. Most of the ones offered in the trade are from seed, and most of them come out good. I'd say 90% of the ones grown from seed are quite good, maybe 10% so so. But uh, we've grown so many from seed, and they and most of them make good food. So that's low quality. And generally, because they're grown from seed, they don't fruit when they're real small. Uh, generally, you have to let them go about eight foot, and they'll start flowering and fruiting. Whereas, you know, these are all grafted trees; they'll fruit at four feet. Uh, Look, what seeds you have to make it up six, seven, eight foot before they start flowering. And then you can hold them there, just prune them every time they finish uh, fruiting. As long as you don't cut off every single leaf, it'll fruit the next year when you're pruning them back. I, and I've done that too. I've taken loquats and cut them back severely so there's not a single leaf left. If you do it early enough after they fruit, they'll have enough strength to bloom them and fruit the next year again. Yeah. No, kumquat's uh, citrus. So this is closest relative to this pear, subject to the same fire blight as pears are. Okay, any questions? I think I. Got